What's in a name? For the topic du jour of this video, the individual words that come together and form a name differed quite substantially in each of the regions that it was released. Seiken Densetsu, Final Fantasy Gaiden, is the original Japanese title for the game. The American localization would transform this into Final Fantasy Adventure, and us Royale with Cheese Folk got Mystic Quest. For the purposes of this video, I shall mostly be referring to the game as Final Fantasy Adventure, as that is the most commonly used title among English language speakers. So welcome to this Final Fantasy Adventure retrospective, the first episode in my coverage of the Mana series. This video will consist of gameplay and story analysis, in addition to a comparison of the differing overarching design philosophies between this game and the other Game Boy release that also happens to contain Final Fantasy in the title. I shall also make you aware now that there will be some spoilers. Subsequent episodes will focus on how each game evolved from prior entries. For this debut outing though, we start with a history lesson. Seiken Densetsu. It translates to Legend of the Holy Sword. Square had originally conceived of a game that would use this title for the Famicom Disk System, subtitled The Emergence of Excalibur. It was a project of immense ambition. A massive role-playing game with a narrative that would span multiple generations, AI-controlled party members who would each display distinctive behavioural patterns in battle, all contained within an unprecedented five diskettes. Sadly, this aspiration was something that Square felt was beyond their capabilities and financial means at the time. Being planned for an April 1987 release, it predates the company's more prosperous post-Final Fantasy years. Thus, they scrapped the project before development commenced. As former Square PR publicist and Final Fantasy Adventures translator Kaoru Moriyama would explain, a five-volume saga was too big of a plan, and it was never supported among the top management so it got cancelled in the beginning of development. It's quite likely that the top management she was referring to envisioned a scenario where the scale of the production could get out of hand, resulting in a heavy financial blow. Square sent out a letter of apology to customers who had pre-ordered the game, not only to confirm its cancellation, but also to recommend that they instead purchase a promising new RPG that would be coming out later that same year, which would of course be Final Fantasy. Right from the very beginning, there was a link between these two series. Many of the staff who were working on the project would move over to Final Fantasy, including series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi and Koichi Ishii, eventual creator and director of the Mana series. It's likely that some planned concept from the cancelled Seiken Densetsu would find new residence in Final Fantasy, the most conclusive being the usage of Excalibur. Sword of Arthurian legend that remains the franchise staple to this day, including as a key plot device in Final Fantasy Adventure. It wouldn't be until a few years later that the Seiken Densetsu trademark would be dusted off, not for use in a cutting edge home console epic, but for a humble Game Boy Adventure. Everything would come back full circle, with many people who had been involved in Final Fantasy, which was a trilogy by this point, now undertaking this new task bringing with them not only far greater expertise in RPG development, but also a collection of already realised elements ready to be directly imported from that franchise. As the original Seiken Densetsu was labelled as Gaiden, or side story to the Final Fantasy series, much of its iconography, naming conventions and narrative style was transplanted over to help give this potential new series an immediate sense of familiarity to players. Items such as ethers and X potions, chocobos, moogles, red and black mages, lich, carry, a late game inclusion of science fiction, they're all here. So while nowadays Final Fantasy Adventure is labelled as a mana game, the title wasn't purely a marketing ploy as with the first saga's rebranding in America, and it truly does belong as part of the Final Fantasy pantheon. So a game bearing the name Seiken Densetsu would finally come out in June of 1991, and then in November of that same year in America. It wouldn't set sail across the Atlantic and make sure in Europe until 1993 though. While there doesn't appear to be an exact release date for Mystic Quest, I've seen sources state that it came out in June in some countries. 
which if true, means that the game predates the other Mystic Quest, known locally as Mystic Quest Legend, by about four months, making this the first game that has relation with Final Fantasy in any way to be released in Europe. When it comes to the actual gameplay, the primary way that Final Fantasy Adventure differentiates itself from the mainline entries is in the combat. This is an action RPG, following in the footsteps of games like Ys and Tower of Druaga, rather than the more methodical turn-based combat that Dragon Quest popularised in Japan after taking inspiration from computer role-playing pioneers Wizardry and Ultima. The hero, who also goes by Sumo, is able to freely run amok across the land and attack any enemy who should happen to be roaming in his nearby vicinity as he pleases. As combat is the crux of the overall experience in a game like this, the developers clearly went to great lengths in designing almost every aspect of the game around this central objective of ensuring battles remain fun throughout the adventure. Upon starting a new quest, you're immediately dropped into a fight to the death, your unwitting self being pit against a ferocious jackal, forcing you to gain combat and survival skills before you've even had a chance to familiarise yourself with anything else. Through this opening clash, the developers are sending a clear message that nothing is more important in this game than being able to fend for yourself. Everything else is secondary. This on-the-job training style approach works perfectly for the system the game has in place. Being that this is a Game Boy title, combat is naturally very simplistic in terms of execution. A single button press equates to a single swing, slash, or thrust of your weapon. While it may be limiting in regards to options, what it has traded off in complexity, it has gained in fluidity. The simple action of attacking the enemy has been finely crafted, from responsiveness, to hit detection, to the delay that you must incur between attacks. Positioning is also a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. As the hero is right-handed, with his left being occupied by a shield, most of your offence will protrude from his right side. Not only does this allow for the effortless immersion into becoming sumo, the game frees itself from any blame arising from shortcomings in the player's skill. If you miss an attack, that's on you, as the game will give you a perfect response to your declaration every single time. And this was nothing short of a revelation for an action RPG on Game Boy in 1991. You have to remember that Link's Awakening was still two years away, and the only similar works prior to Final Fantasy Adventure's release on the system had been ports of games like Druaga or Falcom's Dragon Slayer, which while both seminal titles in their own right, were also already relics of a bygone era. This game represents what is likely the first time that a handheld system was able to reproduce the level of fluidness and precision in its action that had become the standard for its home console counterparts. In spite of the apparent unsophistication, strategy will need to be employed when engaging the enemy, beginning with your weapon of choice. There are six types of deadly instruments that you'll acquire as you progress, ranging from swords to axes to flails, with each of them handling completely different from one another. When speaking to Famitsu, back when it was known as Famicom Tsushin, director Koichi Ishii said in regards to the game's weaponry, I don't think Final Fantasy showed much care for the weapons themselves. One reason is that, at the time, my knowledge about weapons and different types of weapons was somewhat lacking. And so, since continuing my work, I've become more knowledgeable there, and it's led to a new approach for game design. Specifically, I'm talking about a game where the way you fight changes according to the weapons you use, and where each individual weapon feels different. For example, in reality pole arms and spears are actually disadvantageous at close range, and morning stars are terribly heavy and hard to wield. That said, I still want something where it feels fun above all, to swing all those weapons around. What this means for Final Fantasy Adventure's various armaments is that each one is meant to feel like how it would in reality to a degree, whilst also ensuring that it works within the confines of a video game. The sword, being one of the lighter weapons, can be unsheathed rapidly, either striking a foe directly in front of you with a quick stab, or sometimes a slash can hit a slightly off-centre enemy. The axe is sluggish by comparison, but its wider blade means that you don't need to be so precise with your attack, as the arc of its swing will likely land a fatal blow on anything within reach. Then you have the mace, which the hero has to swing a full 360 degrees around himself to build the momentum needed to let it fly out at a great distance. 
The excellent balance across the weapons allows the player to make their own choice based on their preferences. So if like me you found the sword's range to be insufficient at being able to damage foes whilst maintaining a safe distance, then use the flail with its superior range. The different traits that each weapon displays prevents a blanket approach to combat from being taken, and you must fully learn every detail about your selection in order to master control over it. In conjunction to this, the freedom granted allows for a tailored experience where players can experiment at their own leisure and come to their own decision about what they enjoy most. Even though the weapons do have a damage statistic tied to them, they're usually pretty uniform in their overall damage output, so there's no real disadvantage should you wish to forego what may seem like the most powerful option at any given time in place of what you find to be more enjoyable to use. Making use of every weapon will be forced upon you over the course of the game though, as certain enemies are completely immune to specific attack types. Unfortunately, this does become an exercise in trial and error, because you can't apply any sort of logical thinking as to which weapon will be most effective against which enemy. It seems specific monsters were arbitrarily made vulnerable only to certain arms, as even in a fantasy setting, it doesn't make sense why a mage could be harmed by a mace, but is impervious to the steel of a sword. Mass slaughter isn't the sole purpose of your equipage, as their utilitarian design allows them to double up as tools necessary in passing blockades. An axe can cut down trees, while the flail can latch onto posts allowing you to cross small chasms or bodies of water. It's possible that this was an idea purloined from Namco's foray into the top-down adventure genre, Valkyrie no Boken, although that game still designated its battle-ready apparatus as a secondary item to the heroine's sword. What's so great about the system is how it allows for more adventure-style gameplay and puzzle-solving to be incorporated without all the bloat of additional uni-tasker items. Other top-down style games of this nature usually only have a single weapon type, so you don't feel bogged down by all the additional items. But as Final Fantasy Adventure is a game where conflict takes centre stage, this alternative was needed. Naturally forming barricades, such as rocks and ferns, also give the world more authenticity in its design. The itinerant hero must forge his own path through the savage lands, rather than follow artificially designed pathways that cause navigation to become a mindless task. This does lead into what is easily the game's biggest weakness, which is how laborious it is to change equipment, items and magic. As the A button is used exclusively for attacking when not in a menu, all the other tasks that Sumo was capable of had to be designated to the B button, meaning item usage, such as healing potions or matox to break through walls, and casting spells, both offensive and curative, are all condensed into the same action. The problem is that you can only have a single item or spell assigned at any given time, and there's no swift means of making an alteration. So if you come face to face with an enemy that is vulnerable to magic, you'll need to open the menu, select a spell, back out of the menu, and conjure it. Should you take damage in this conflict though, and wish to heal, you'll need to repeat the process and select a healing spell or potion. Then, if in that same room there is some debris that needs clearing, it's back into the menu once more to select the matok. Weaponry is affected by this same issue, as you'll constantly be needing to substitute your currently equipped armament, either because the current one isn't of any use against the enemies you're dealing with at present, or because you need a specific secondary function. Compounding this matter yet even further, is that there is no indication of what item or spell you're currently donning without opening the menu. And as items have a limited number of uses, you want to be certain of what actions you'll perform before committing to doing so, as to not be wasteful. For all the excellence that the combat system achieves in making the action flow at a smooth pace, the constant need to delve into the menus causes too many interruptions to the gameplay and really breaks your immersion. Just when you're building up some momentum and breathing from one room of a dungeon to another, you'll inevitably need to force a grinding halt upon the game so that you can trawl through your items and spells. This almost defeats the purpose of having the game not utilise menu-based combat, as an action RPG such as this should be a more kinetic, faster-paced experience in lieu of this stop-and-start form that many sections of Final Fantasy Adventure devolves into. While the inherent limitation of a two-button setup is partly to blame here, Developers, especially those of the calibre involved here, should have found a solution that worked around this restraint, rather than submit to it. AI-controlled party members 
which would become a brand standard, began here, and it's a rough start to be sure. Those who are capable of fighting mostly spend their time meandering about the screen with seemingly no rhyme or reason, occasionally remembering to utilise whatever they happen to be wielding. Thankfully, you're also not expected to rely on allies whilst in the midst of battle, and will be plenty capable of taking down the hordes of foes by yourself. I think the inclusion of an artificially controlled ally was a bit too ambitious of an idea, especially considering the meagre processing power of the Game Boy. Having comrades who could act autonomously was still an innovative idea at the time. Some contemporary console RPGs were also experimenting with this feature, only to produce similar results to what we have here. And it wouldn't really be until the new millennium that the genre would achieve something close to competent companions, and even then results would remain hit and miss. Partners do prove themselves useful in another way though. By selecting the Ask command in the menu, the current ally will perform a unique action. This ranges from casting a healing spell, to providing hints, or in the case of the chocobo, mounting it for more efficient movement across the world map. I think more than anything, the inclusion of non-playable party members was to grant the hero an opportunity at interaction and develop relationships. Dialogue may be minimal, but each character who joins you comes with their own story, motivations, and reasons for aiding you. They all have a small narrative arc, and you share in their triumphs and losses, and in some cases, their brief tales prove to be as strong as that of the central hero. Rounding out the core gameplay mechanics is the levelling system, which applies the same philosophy seen in the weapons, letting the player tweak the experience in small ways to their own liking, creating an adventure unique to them. Upon reaching a new level, you can put a point into one of four options, each of which relates to the stats of your hero. So raising your stamina will make you more durable through an increased maximum HP, whereas willpower increases the rate that the will bar that you'll find at the bottom of the screen fills up, which is the means of performing special attacks. Being able to modify your build over the course of the game does allow you to adapt it to your own playstyle, as well as remedy any flaws that present themselves. Constantly running out of MP, spending the next few level up points on wisdom should mitigate this. If you find that you're not making use of special attacks frequently, and instead prefer the consistent reliability of a regular sword swing, then you can ignore boosting your willpower and put those points into strength. Being able to select exactly how you want to develop sumo is also the main source of replayability of the game, as you can always try for a completely different strategy with an alternate focus in subsequent playthroughs. Thanks to its considered gameplay design, what you have in Final Fantasy Adventure is a work that is surprisingly accessible for the time, and I think that was a deliberate intention on the developer's part. Prior to the start of Seiken Densetsu's development, Square had only released a single other title for the Game Boy, Makai Toshi Saga, which would be rebranded in America as the Final Fantasy Legend. I got a sense when playing through Final Fantasy Adventure that the driving tenet of the game's design was to examine everything Saga did and do the exact opposite. Saga was designed by Akatoshi Kawazu, the man behind Final Fantasy II's highly experimental levelling system, whereby the actions characters performed in battle would dictate their growth, in place of a lump sum of EXP points. Square found this system to be a bit avant-garde for their breakout franchise, so ditched it for the third game, which was a reasonable decision on their part, as while it was a unique concept, its execution in Final Fantasy II left a lot to be desired. Kawazu would instead be allowed to develop the company's first handheld game, and in doing so, let his own brand of creative insanity run free. The resulting game was one designed to be as complex, difficult, and opaque as possible, with Saga expanding on the work Kawazu had started with Final Fantasy and taking it to new extremes. Very little about the inner workings of the game is explained to the player, who have to unfurl systems such as the three different classes who all grow stronger in completely different ways. Mutants would acquire new spells at random, although they also had as much chance at losing one. Monsters could be fed meat in order to evolve, but depending on the current species and the type of meat you feed them, they could end up adopting a weaker form. The end result was a hostile game that demanded its players dedicate themselves to figuring out how it all worked. But it was undoubtedly a brilliantly unique and engaging product, just occasionally unscrupulous. Final Fantasy Adventure, in stark contrast to this, 
make the concerted effort to ensure that it is a game which anyone can play and derive enjoyment from, thanks to its many user-friendly offerings. Upon levelling up, all of your health and MP is restored. You can save the game absolutely anywhere you like, and restart your adventure from the very room you left off at. Should you happen to enter the screen where a boss resides and you weren't prepared for it, you can freely retreat and tackle it whenever you're ready. Dungeons that are situated in the more remote locations of the map, far from the safety of a town, will have a nearby inn and item shop so that you can recover and stock up on essential supplies. Speaking of shops, weapons and items are very affordable, and you'll always have enough gold on hand to upgrade your gear whenever you come across a new store, and you'll always have ample funds left over to purchase any potions and keys that you may wish. As the global Game Boy market was becoming increasingly diverse in terms of the age and experience of its players, in large part thanks to the universal appeal of Tetris, it was a prudent move for the team to develop a game that anyone could pick up and enjoy right away. Furthermore, it was quite likely that this would be many people's first time experiencing a role-playing game, so extra work was clearly put in into creating an adventure that would be accommodating and forgiving, where mistakes wouldn't go unpunished, but the penalties weren't too severe. Revisiting the game today, it feels like they may have been overly cautious in their approach to accessibility though, and through their attempt to make a game with broad appeal, managed to do away with most of the game's difficulty. With healing spells costing minimal MP, and monsters dropping potions and ethers more frequently than you can use them, you're almost never at risk of death. This is most notable in boss fights, where the most efficient strategy ends up being to mindlessly wail on them, only stopping to heal when needed. Even the final boss falls victim to this primitive tactic, and so not giving the game's finale quite the gravitas it should have. As I mentioned earlier, much of the talent who are credited with making Final Fantasy Adventure had previously worked on the main series of games, with most being involved in the second entry in particular. Facets of that game can be observed in much of Adventure, such as the revolving door of party members, but nowhere is it more prominent than in the game's story. The manual recommends that you read its short history section to get you up to speed. Should you choose to do so, you'll be presented with a harrowing tale about the state that the world is in, with a description of the horrific lifestyle that slaves of the Glaive Empire are subject to. It is also within the manual's confines that you can learn about the Mana Tree, the source of all life in Final Fantasy Adventure's world, how ruthless campaigns have been actioned in order to seize this tree's deity-like powers, and of the gallant knights who sworn to protect it. Details like these provide the game's world with a history and identity that gives an impression of being genuinely lived in, rather than as a fictional construct. Once you actually start the game, you get to immediately experience the sense of despair and oppression that this realm's inhabitants are suffering from. After killing the initial jackal, you come across your friend Willy, who is on the verge of death. With his final words, he sets you off on what will become a quest to save the world from the Dark Lord of the Glaive Empire. From here onwards, suffering, loss, and death are omnipresent for the duration of the story. Many characters that become directly involved in your quest as well as random townsfolk, will often speak of the hardships they're facing, and of those they have lost to the Empire. The game presents the idea that in order to overcome an evil and corrupt institution, great commitment is required, often in the form of sacrifice, and that the side of good will have to endure many losses on their way. Multiple instances occur throughout the game of characters willingly sacrificing themselves for the betterment of others, such as Amanda, who requests that the hero kills her as she is transforming into a Medusa, but is also able to save her brother in the process. Not only are you forced to witness multiple deaths, but you're also often made responsible for informing those close to the deceased of what has transpired. It takes the time to show what effect someone passing away has on those around them, and how they in turn deal with this, generating a feeling of empathy and desire to push forward and take down the tyrannical Dark Lord. Even the game's ending is quite a melancholy one, as the heroine must also sacrifice herself in order to become the new mana tree. With it being noted that she has yet to have any children, the lineage will end, and her reincarnation as the life-giving tree will be the last. Should tragedy befall her, the consequences on all life would be catastrophic, with Sumo taking up the mantle as the guardian who will devote himself to prevent that occurrence. 
The message I felt that the ending was trying to convey was that even after success, continued hard work and dedication is needed to maintain what you've achieved, and that complacency will lead to regression. Yoshinori Kitase is the man credited for the game scenario, and should be commended for not shying away from including some heavy themes in a game just because it was a smaller handheld title. The presentation of the story doesn't quite live up to its contents, but is still exceptional given the game's vintage. Final Fantasy Adventure manages its time well, and moments where the action takes a break is usually spent on furthering the narrative in some way. Taking me around 9 hours to complete, this is a concise game, and I was genuinely satisfied with how much of that was dedicated to the plot and characters. It does feel like in the latter half of the game that the story loses its way a little bit. The Tree of Mana is the most interesting concept, clearly inspired by the Tree of Life, a myth theme that has featured in many cultures' mythologies and religious texts throughout history. A lot of your time is diverted away from this central idea though, sending you on various tasks that don't always feel like they appropriately feed into the wider narrative. Some unique twists do occur though, with varying levels of effectiveness. While the beginning of the game establishes that the Dark Lord is to be the main antagonist, you'll end up killing him just over halfway into the story. Following this, his subordinate Julius is revealed to be the true villain, and proves to be a far more dangerous adversary. It's not too far from how Keska is presented in Final Fantasy VI, with his frequent appearances early on quietly building him up for events that would unfold later. Likewise, Julius is the character whose actions we actually bear witness to, only ever learning of the Dark Lord's atrocities through hearsay. This means that when the plot twist does occur, the character who ends up being the final boss has already been given plenty of on-screen time to be established and developed. The other key event is that at one point, the hero quits. After all the struggle he went through to defeat the Dark Lord, only to find that his efforts were for naught, he concedes defeat, angry that the world's fate seemingly rests entirely on his shoulders. About two minutes later, he's changed his mind though, causing this interesting development to only be a fleeting one. As Sumo's regularly scheduled heroics return, and these feelings of his are never explored again. Bringing such an ambitious story to life through an action game, with a large variety of locales and dungeons, does come at a cost, with that being the very bare bones presentation of the game. Final Fantasy Adventure's graphics aren't bad, but they are simplistic and repetitive, likely in an effort to save space and keep the game running smoothly. Most of the overworld will seem considerably barren, and locations aren't memorable in the slightest but areas do have small affectations to help make them identifiable. You can differentiate between the arid desert and the frozen tundra easily enough, so you'll always know where you're situated in the world, not that there's a great deal of exploration to do. Dungeons are particularly problematic with their homogenous styling. Every room looks the same, and it's easy to become disoriented with there being no map to assist you in getting your bearings. The overworld does feature the bare minimum of what can be called a map, in the form of a blank 16x16 grid with a few icons indicating settlements, but without any guidance on how you're supposed to travel from one area to another. Other minor graphical issues present themselves as well. Sprite flicker will occur as expected when the screen becomes overly cluttered, and you're not always given feedback on whether your attack has actually landed or not. What's more problematic though is that the game doesn't provide any sort of indication that you're low on health. With life being measured by a number, rather than something more visual like hearts, it's easy to lose focus on how much remaining health you have, and should you reach critically low levels, there's no audio or visual prompt to let you know that you're knocking on death's door. That isn't to say everything about the presentation quality is poor though. For one, there's a large variety of enemy types, and each new area and accompanying dungeon will always introduce new monsters. This will of course mean that you'll need to learn both their behaviours and their vulnerabilities ensuring that you're always engaged with combat every time you encounter something new. I also like how the game incorporates sound into its storytelling. There's a lot of sombre music here that's reflective of the more downbeat story being told. Arriving at one town in particular, Jad, will be greeted with no music whatsoever. The use of silence is very striking, and is a creative way of warning the player that danger lurks ahead. While an ominous composition could have been used, by removing the non-diegetic sound entirely, it gives a sense of lifelessness to the area. Townsfolk are walking about as usual, but are living under a severely corrupt regime, which you come to learn has turned the local harpist into a parrot, 
hence the absence of music. Only when you have saved him do melodies flow through the town again, bringing hope to his residence once more. Final Fantasy Adventure would prove to be an influential title, and a great reference point for all developers looking to make a top-down action game for the system. Nintendo almost certainly studied what Square accomplished on their underpowered handheld, and used that to help with the creation of Zelda Link's Awakening. Final Fantasy Adventure would demonstrate both what the Game Boy was capable of, as well as highlight some areas of weakness that Nintendo were able to successfully work around. What Zelda did was retain a lot of what worked so well in Final Fantasy Adventure, in addition to identifying its deficiencies, mainly the cumbersome item swapping, and found an alternative. It even lifted some ideas directly from the game, such as walls that can be broken making a distinct sound when you hit them. Twenty years after Adventure's release, Nintendo would select Grezzo, the development studio that Koichi Ishii was president of as the team who would bring Ocarina of Time to the 3DS and it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that their decision came in part thanks to his portfolio of handheld role-playing games, which all started with Final Fantasy Adventure. Square themselves also take some of the accessibility features that were used here for their deliberately dumbed-down RPG, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Not only would that game allow the player to save anywhere, in place of save points, which the main entries had adopted, but it also featured weapons that had explorative uses outside of battle. Playing through Final Fantasy Adventure today is definitely something that's difficult to recommend for anyone wanting to start the Mana series, thanks to numerous remakes that would improve upon the game in a plethora of ways. Action is slow and monotonous by today's standards, the need to constantly change items and equipment is maddening, and the story, while bolder and darker than what you might expect, is still quite basic. A lot of enjoyment can still be derived from the game though, mostly down to how accessible it is when compared to so many other 8-bit RPGs and it's definitely worthy of a revisit as a historical piece, not only for the action RPG genre, but for action games on the Game Boy period. Square clearly still recognises the significance of the game as part of the Mana franchise's lineage, opting to include it in the collection of Mana re-release package over any of the remakes. Even looking past some of its archaic 1991 tendencies that the game is naturally going to contain, it's not hard to see how this was a very progressive game in many ways. By successfully balancing traditional RPG standards, such as the hero's statistics being represented by numerical values that can be augmented through equipment, with facets of adventure games that have a broader appeal, this was an experience that can be enjoyed by enthusiasts of the genre, but also not scare away the more casual crowd that made up a large portion of the Game Boy's user base. In short, Final Fantasy Adventure is a spectacular achievement of a game that was a perfect match for the platform it was on, and would be the cornerstone that many action games would build upon in the years that followed. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. In the next episode, the Final Fantasy connection is ditched, and the time of mana begins. Until then, please wait warmly.